Today, we're going to talk about how you can grow 10,000 pounds of tomatoes in your hoop house. But let's back up a little bit. YouTube is filled of videos with all kinds of claims like that, crazy numbers that seem impossible. But what I want to do is give you the information that you can take all the variables and really dial down your area and your operation and give you a better idea of everything that very seasoned farmers do that kind of specialize in tomatoes, or at least that's a big part of their operation and how those numbers are achievable, and the amount of skill, the amount of expertise, the amount of patience, and quite frankly, good luck play into some of those roles. So let's dive into how you can look at your operation, how you can size your greenhouse, and determine what kind of numbers are actually possible. And then we're going to look at all the variables within the idea of a bell curve and how some of that can affect the overall pounds at the end of the season. All right, so a couple of weeks ago, we put out this video in which we talked about, hey, if you're a small grower and you have a few tomato plants or, or a smaller operation, how you can make a few tweaks to get more pounds and more profit from those plants. In this video, we're taking a look at how people that specialize in tomatoes, and when I say that, this very well could be a market garden type situation where, yes, they do grow everything, but because tomatoes are one of the big money makers and some of those foundational principles are in that video. So I do encourage you to watch that before you kind of, you know, that's part one, this is part two kind of thing. Their experience and how their dedication to that crop in particular over a 12 month period with consideration of all the things we're gonna talk about in that video, how they can either increase or decrease the amount of pounds per plant per season. And that, that's one of the things I want us to think about is this average amount of pounds per plant per year and this plant in one part of your hoop house versus this plant over here, they might have slightly different yields and we're gonna get into some of that. So we're going to look at this in three parts. Number one, indeterminate hoop house production in regards to space and planting sites. Number two, we're going to develop a year long calendar plan and we're going to show you how to do that in your area. And number three, we're going to look at a host of different variables and scenarios that all play into that bell curve of learning. So if we look at tomato production or any production on a bell curve, there's going to be that time when you first start on one end, and then there's going to be the erratic conditions and things you need to prepare for on the other. And in the middle, you have this nice zone in which most everything is working perfectly and all of your plans come into place to give you the most opportunity to grow your tomatoes to the very best that they can be. We're looking at things like weather, disease, too much or too little water, how to get around frost and cold snaps, pest pressure, wasted infrastructure, supplies, labor and opportunities within your growing season. We're going to look at fresh air circulation, maintenance, training, checklists, heat, and improper planning and procrastination. And so throughout this, you can expect a, a little waveform of, hey, we're growing everything great. We're actually, we got too much to harvest and man, we had a rough week, it got too hot. That's why I want you to look at this as a season long investment in time, labor, all that kind of stuff. So let's discuss, if we're talking about pounds of tomatoes, how much is a pound of tomatoes? If you take three tomatoes about the size of a baseball, that's an equal pound. And this fool right here is pushing mad weight in tomatoes. The next major concept I want you to think about in this video and any other video or blog or article that you read is what is the average number of pounds per vine that you can expect from your tomatoes? You can type that question into any search engine of your choice and you're going to see this wide range of between 10 and 20 pounds. And let's examine that for a minute. Why is that such a big range and where are they coming up with those numbers? They don't know if you're growing indeterminates, bush, are you in a hoop house? Are you doing things correctly? Are you on a big scale, yay or nay? And so in the exercises that we're fixing to talk about, we're going to look at, okay, 10 to 20 pounds. If that's our starting point, and all of this is a starting point with a bunch of assumptions and speculation, let's put 10 to 20 right in the middle, 15 pounds is what we should very conservatively look at when we're planning, is this crop going to be worth our time, money, and effort? This can be based on factors like specific varieties, growing conditions, care practices, optimal, and I'm gonna stress optimal greenhouse conditions, and what that individual's plant yield could be. So we're going to look at sizing your hoop house, spacing your rows and plants, conceptualizing the idea of growing range and variables, and the economical and individual farm factors that not only affect the pounds per vine, but affect the sales price on the other end of the spectrum. 
So in preparation for this exercise, we spent a lot of time in research and overall, every single hoop house that we looked at that were claiming these type of numbers was a 30 by 100. So we're talking a pretty standard but commercial size greenhouse. And I know most of the greenhouses we sell are in the 20 foot range and with uh, variable lengths. So we're going to give you some exercises to kind of think through if you're at a, sc a smaller scale. But if these 10,000 pounds are the claims that are being made, I wanna examine how they're getting there and then back it down to smaller or middle sized scales or even larger scales that are just starting and are eventually going to get there. Please keep in mind, the amount of tomatoes you're gonna to grow, even if you do everything perfect year one, is going to be vastly lower than where you're going to be at year two and year three. You're incrementally going to see an increase of those numbers over time. A standard 30 by 100, there's two variables that we need to account for, and most of that is concerning the walkways. If we have a four foot walkway, which may account for some of the carts and some of the other operations that are kind of set in place with that farm's operational needs, Four foot walkway, pretty standard. That means you have five rows of tomato production inside of a hoop house. Usually this kind of operation means that you're only doing tomatoes or some type of fruiting crop in there. So let's examine those row setups. We're looking at 42 foot rows, which gives you four foot of working ends so you can do the lower and lean and wrap around that we'll talk about here in a little bit. This also considers that on the side walls, we have a three foot spacing. So in the middle rows, we have four foot to get the carts down. You're not really going to harvest on the outside edge of the rows. A pretty standard variable is the 24 inch wide rows and 18 to 24 inch spacing on the tomatoes. Now, what I'm going to ask you to do and you can experiment with this year one and experiment with it maybe halfway year two. What you're gonna find is instead of 24 inches, you're, you're probably going to get overzealous, everybody does, and crunch that down to the minimum 18 inches. If you're like me, and if you're like every other tomato farmer I've ever been to, you're still crunching just a little bit more, maybe down to 16 inches. I don't recommend that year one because it's a whole lot of extra labor kind of don't, you need to get in the rhythm of understanding how to do the lower and leaning because it's so valuable to get that airflow in there. I know farmers, I know you, you're gonna crunch more in. So it says at an 18 inch spacing, which is already on the lower side, that we're looking at 62 plants. I went ahead and figured 68 plants. The other thing that that does, and the thing I do encourage you to do, is plant a few extra plants you're inevitably going to step on one, there's going to be an accident, you're gonna lose a plant here or there. And instead of having to worry about planting a new one, which is also an option that we're going to talk about, you have this extra little bit of plants in there to almost have a sacrificial loss. The other thing that does is it gives you a few extra plants to increase the number of plants, which means pounds per year, pounds per season, that we're trying to aim to get to as we reach these higher numbers. So that gives us 340 plants at the average of 15 pounds per plant gives us 5,100 pounds of tomatoes. The second scenario I see a lot of is instead of four foot, we're looking at a three foot spacing of the rows. So still the 92 foot rows with the four foot working ends, still 24 inch beds, necking that down to a three foot walkway with the three foot on the outside walls, just like the other hoop house. Still at the 18 inch spacing, but cramming a couple more plants in there to give us 68 plants per row. That's 408 plants versus the five rows at 340 plants. So 408 plants at 15 pounds on average gives us 6,120. So just that one little foot difference in the walkway, we're gonna go from 5,100 pounds of tomatoes to 6,100 pounds of tomatoes. And that's if everything is just done average. So in this graph, we're going to look at five rows and six rows. What if things don't go right and you only get 10 pounds per plant? What if you stay at the average and go 15 pounds? What if you do things a little better and have 20 pounds? What if you do things a little better and a little bit more prepared? You're looking at 25 pounds. And if everything goes right, and if all the weather is doing everything you hope it to do, and you don't have any accidents or misfortune or life events come up, it is highly possible that you can reach 30 pounds I doubt it's gonna happen your first year, but this is a good goal to strive for. If you look on the bell graph, 10, 15, 20, 25, and 30 pounds, you can see that those numbers of pounds per plant can significantly increase if everything goes right. Now I wanna back down to what most bootstrap farmer customers are looking at. I mean, we, we sell 20 foot kits way more than we do 30 foot kits. 
And so I wanna give you something that for our growers that are looking into this, a little bit smaller operation, maybe not as big, let's get into it. A 20 foot by 100 foot hoop house, still a 92 foot rows, still 24 inch beds. I went ahead, it has to be a three foot walkway for this spacing, that's four rows at our 68 plants per row. That's 272 plants with an average pound per plant of 15 pounds, gives us 4,000. If this is the average hoop house, right, of a market farmer out there, and I told you right now, hey, you have to sell 4,000 pounds of tomatoes. Is that more daunting or is it, hey, you have to sell 10,000 pounds of tomatoes? That's a whole other back end situation in which you're now looking at your marketing and your transportation and all your sales outlets. So just because 10,000 pounds is possible, it may not be possible to sell that 10,000 pounds, especially your first season as you're getting established. So I'm, I'm kind of making this video as a warning that it's real easy to get excited by $100,000 worth of revenue on your farm. It's real easy to get excited by 10,000 pounds of tomatoes per year. But reality sets in, you're year one, you're, you're doing all these plants, you're going to stress yourself out by attaining these numbers that are meant to sensationalize what some of these other farmers are doing year 10, year 12, year 15 into the game. What you really want to be focusing on year one, two, three, four, five, in that it's getting your systems down, it's getting those reps in. So by the time you do build that client base, you are hitting these numbers to reach those sales outlets. It's just, we see it time and time again, people, people take on more than they can handle in the beginning, then they get discouraged. I don't want that for you. 10 through 30 pounds of tomatoes, you can see that just a few changes can make a big difference between a very bad year at 10 pounds to an exceptional perfect year at 30 pounds. And I hesitated to put this slide in, but I wanted to also give you a framework. People, when they call in, they're like, hey, how much is a hoop house? Well, what all options that you have? We have tons of resources on that. This video is meant to be an overview. So every, every time you see a slide like that, and I have the YouTube icon, that means that there is a video that we go into great detail. If like right now, this is the, we're putting this video out in the very, very late part of the summer. So you have time to plan for the next year. So you have time to watch all these videos and to give us a call and ask us questions and, and go through our tech team. We're here for you seven days a week. And so I just needed to give you a baseline of what a hoop house costs. This is base. This is not trellising. This isn't shade. We don't know what you need. We're, we'll walk you through that in the video. But if we do a 30 by 100 foot base cost, you're looking at about $21,000. And a base cost for 2100, you're looking at just under $12,000. So keep those two numbers in mind as you're thinking about all this pounds. Am I gonna do this? Am I gonna do that? That's, that's the base that this is going to be at. Now, if you already have a hoop house and it's a different size, these numbers are all variables. And I'm, I'm hoping that we laid this out in a way that you can take a look at that and adjust those as you go. So if we take our two different sizes of hoop houses and we look at their square footage, and if we do, listen, this is another variable that, you know, it's hard to pinpoint. So I, I went super conservative on, let's assume that you can sell your tomatoes at a very low price of $3 per pound. Now, when it comes to pricing, that's, I could sit here and talk three days about this and all the, the processes that go on that. But for this exercise, if we're looking at a wholesale type volume, kind of on average, no matter where you're at in the country, we're, we have to settle in on a number. So I've settled in on a very conservative $3 per pound. So if you look at 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 pounds, if you look at the amount of pounds that could be possible in all that, and if you look at $3 per pound and you start multiplying all that out, let's focus on a 30 by 100, the least amount, the least amount that we can figure on this exercise with these variables is $10,200. If everything goes perfect and you're year 10 into this and you have all of your systems dialed in and your labor is awesome and everything, your sales channels, everything is perfect and you have zero food waste, it is possible to get over $35,000. Same thing on the 20 by 100. Bottom line, $8,100. Top line, $24,000. And if you compare the lowest at $8,100, and a hoop house is $12,000. By the time you do amortizations and options and you consider your build prep and labor, your land, your utilities, your input, your pricing, and all of the other variables we're going to discuss, you can see how this is a pretty great investment in hoop house production, being able to pay for itself, maybe not year one, but if everything is perfect and you're great at it, it's totally possible to 
pay off this hoop house in year one. The other thing I want to discuss is if we're going to talk about $3 per pound, we need to understand kind of where that number comes from. It's, we're at the end of summer, and if you go to the grocery store right now today, tomatoes are super cheap. Why is that? Well, tomatoes are a commodity crop, and as Mexico and Canada right now, they're churning out all of our tomatoes that are pretty much in the supermarket by a very large percentage, not all, by a very large percentage, are being imported into the states. As the U.S. temperature increases and as some of these other farms struggle, we start seeing these imports. What does that do? That crashes the price because there's so much more tomatoes available to these supermarkets. The system is decades old, and so what I want you to consider is as these imports are coming in, I don't want you to go to the grocery store and going, oh my God, I have to lower my prices. These prices are gigantic operations that specialize in tomatoes and specialize in the importing of tomatoes and specialize in contracts and wholesale prices and all that stuff. That's not your competition. You are not competing with people going to some of the big box grocery stores. You're competing with people that you have established relationships that care about local food. So while we talk about that mysterious $3 per pound, know that you should be aiming for a much larger price and at the end of this video, we're going to be talking about some of the things that you can do to kind of give you a framework to go, I sell tomatoes at $7 a pound, $5 a pound, $3 a pound, and then I'm donating some. So all of these prices, even within your own small operation, could be very variable depending on your situation. So individual farm variables, labor cost, pest and disease pressure, weather extremes, missed sales and goal opportunities, life events. Listen, folks. The number one thing I see that small farms, small market gardens, homesteaders have is when life events happen. You have a kid, there's an accident, you have a parent pass away, all of these things happen. And these are the things that tend to devastate small farms and really cut you down at the knees. So you can plan all this, but just know as a small individual operator, you may need to allow for, hey, I need to take a couple of weeks off, we need to take a month off, hey, we lost the whole season because of these life events that pop up. It's a reality, I need you to be aware of it. If you have a break in infrastructure or have some type of storm damage or any other X factor that can happen throughout the course of the year, so you can have your plan and you can have all these variables pop up and then you can take your experience and your tenacity as a farmer and you can continue to learn through videos like this and hopefully through your local networks and talking to other farmers. And the only thing we're asking you to do is get a little bit better every single day and then transfer that knowledge into next year's operation. And you can go from this to this in a matter of a couple of years. The next section, we're going to talk about developing a year-long calendar plan. We're going to find your average last frost date. We're going to use that to do some crop planning. We're going to talk about seeding, hardening off, up potting, transplanting, all the tomato chores and harvest, and then how to end the cycle at the year and to start all over. So if we look at tomato production on a year-long scale, which I think you tend not to do in the beginning, but this is what seasoned, seasoned farmers right now doing tomato stuff are already thinking about their seeds. We're putting this out in uh, September 2024. They're already thinking about it. And here's how that happens. We have a video that talks about how to find your last frost date. Know that the United States is broke up into 13 growing zones and northern growers have a much shorter window. So even if everything is perfect, it's, it's unlikely that unless you have a very large structure and the very best help and everything is working, that that 10,000 pounds is going to happen. In the south, there's four zones that do not have an average frost date, which means their season not only can be much, much longer, but they may not have an end season. So now you're looking at succession planting of tomatoes. We're not really gonna get into that video. We're going to look at the law of averages that we're, we're talking about here. We're gonna throw a dart on the map and we're gonna land right in the middle of the United States at Kansas City. Even within Kansas City, we're looking at two different growing zones. No matter where you are in the country, do this exercise. Find your growing zone. Kansas City, Missouri happens to be in zone 7A. The average last frost date for zone 7A, and again, this will change depending on your location, will be between March 22nd and April 3rd. I don't want you planning anything before April 3rd because last frost dates always, you know. So if we settle in on March 22nd through April 3rd, that's our starting point for this calendar. April 3rd is the day that you should be anticipating to plant your transplants. So how do we get there? Let's go back three months. January 1st, I want you 
to make a New Year's resolution that you're going to figure out a way that works best for you to, to collect data throughout the year in order to help the next year's season. But we're not quite there yet. I want you to use this exercise to plan 2025 or whatever year that you're watching this, but know that January 1st, recommit yourself to being a better farm owner and start collecting data. You have a couple of weeks to figure that out. Three months before April 3rd, you can start your tomato seeds and you're, going to, and you're going to bottom water daily. February 1st, as those seeds are germinating, you're going to install and check your overhead trellising and check your inventory of trellising equipment. Do you need clips? Do you need clamps? Do you need turnbuckles? Do you need to go back and maintain or fix anything that maybe got loose uh, over the next year? Start thinking about your trellising now. This gives you a couple of months to figure that out. February 22nd, we're going to start look at solarizing or oculating or some type of how are we going to reduce the amount of weeds in the hoop house. We have a big video about that and we also have a slide that we're going to talk about that a little bit later. But just know that two months out is when you need to start suppressing those weeds, killing out those weeds in, in any manner that you see fit. This is a no-till version of that, which I find most of our farmers tend to do. So that's the time. A week after that, you're going to do at least round one of your up potting, which could be into a two and a half or a 3.3 inch pot and continue to bottom water daily. Now, if you're not in an extreme southern zone and if you already have a hoop house in place and, and you're able to start the hardening off process, if temperatures are favorable and we're talking about 65 to 75 degrees, you can move those plants out in the middle of the day or late in the morning and start the hardening off process. A week or so after that, you can start installing or checking your overhead and drip water lines, faucets, filters, emitters, do a complete run so you're looking for leaks. One thing I don't want you to do is not think about your irrigation, plant your transplants into dry soil, turn that on to water for the first time, and then you got a busted system, and now your plants are at the height of their fragileness in a brand new environment with dry ground. They're dying by the second. You need to make sure that you have your irrigation in place before you transplant. We're looking at the first range of the day of the average last frost date. So you need to start monitoring your weather very closely. I don't want you to plant in March because I want you to be up planting as you go. So we're finally to the last date of the average frost range on April 3rd. This is when we transplant into the hoop house. You're going to overhead water and you're going to continue to overhead water until the drip watering begins. A couple of weeks after transplant is when you can start trellising your plants. So you'll have a little string and you're going to clamp or clip that vine to the string so it can start growing up. This is also the time that you would start the bifurcation process if you're going to do two liters. An indeterminate tomato is grown one of two ways. A single liter in which one plant puts out one stem and you're pruning all of the little suckers that come out that could make other vines and you're focusing your energy on one tomato vine. The other way some people tend to do it is they'll plant less plants but they'll run two liters. So the plants here, two liters here, we have a whole section of that later on, but this is, if we're talking about the calendar situation, when that would begin as you're trellising up. And again, you're at the two week mark after transplant, you're likely to start the overhead watering. It could be a little bit of both in the beginning. You're gonna have to go out there, monitor, and see how things are. And two to three weeks after that is when hopefully you start to see some fruit clusters forming. And if you've up potted enough and if you're in a zone of the country in which you're already getting a lot of heat and everything are favorable, you may start to get some of your first fruits off the vine. This is a month or so into the farmer's market. Sometimes some of you in lower states, you're already at the farmer's market. Now you're first to market and you're going to dominate that market. So after that first harvest and you're going to start continue the pruning process and you're going to start the harvest process that's going to take you all the way through June, July, August, September. And you're gonna have four months of infrastructure in which you're not having to do anything other than focusing on the pruning, care, growing, maintaining, and harvesting of these plants. So now we're starting to look at the average first frost date range, and that's anywhere from, in this example of zone 6B, October 29th through November 15th. So three to four weeks out, you're going to cut the top of the vine off, the crown. You're basically telling that plant, hey, you're not going to be able to grow anymore. All of this energy you're still uh, bringing up from the soil and the sun, put that into the current vegetable production. This is going to help you in the season at a very precise time so you can start the next round. And the first frost happens at the very last part of that range. Once those temperatures dip below a certain point, usually 50, 55 degrees, that 
heat-loving tomato plant is cashed out for the season. So remember, about a month before, you top that vine, you put all the last bit of energy into the last bit of tomatoes, and you've extended your season until the very last possible moment. Once that frost hits, I want you to remove those vines. You're gonna pull them out. I want you to then the next week or roundabout enjoy Thanksgiving. And then after Thanksgiving, I want you to furlough or cover crop or plant your next seasonal crop to even get more money out of your hoop house. So maybe you're doing some lettuce successions, some kale, some leafy greens, anything that can survive the cold. And you can look at any number of the hoop house four season growing stuff that we have on YouTube that kind of talks about that. And in between Thanksgiving and Christmas, as you're deciding what you're going to do with your hoop house for this part of the season, I also want you to do your hoop house maintenance and start the planning process from all that data you collected all season long on what changes or focus points you're gonna do for the next year. And then you're going to take that plan and you're gonna repeat and profit and with that year of experience under your belt, you'll see that incremental increase in yield and confidence that you have in yourself as a grower. Now we're on to the third part of this presentation in which we're gonna take all of those variables that we talk about on that bell graph, and we're going to look at everything a seasoned farmer thinks about and has to deal with throughout the course of a tomato season. Now, this is a very high level video, so I'm not going to get super down in the detailed weeds. I'm only hitting the highlights of stuff that I learned myself at my tomato greenhouse and what I've spent the last 10 years talking to other farmers in multiple states about. So this is the very high level information. This is designed to give you almost a checklist of things to think about and consider and research on your own for your farm, your area, and what you want to do. Number one, seed categories. Your market is going to ask you for different types of tomatoes based on what they want. Listen, focus in, focus in. Don't grow tomatoes for what you want. Grow tomatoes for what your customers are going to give you their money for. And the way you do that is you ask them, you pay attention, and if you are romantically involved in some type of tomato that doesn't sell, bounce that and focus on what did sell. So categories include beefsteak, cherry, grape, artisan tomatoes, paste tomatoes, plum and roma. Each one of these has their own pros and cons. Some, like cherry and grapes, are more prone to splitting. There could be other growing challenges associated with bigger tomatoes. Cherry and grape artisan tomatoes require vastly more labor than your big slicing tomatoes because you're having to pick so much more individual ones versus picking one. Or sometimes you can go in the middle and pick a whole cluster at a time. Take a look at all these different variables and see, hey, do I have time to plant? I know my customers love grape tomatoes, maybe they'll buy all we got, but do you want to sit there and pick all these individual ones? It's, it's not something that's very feasible unless that's just something you're going to specialize in. Some of these fruits are more marketable than others. When it comes to seeds, make the investment in fresh seeds. Many of these varieties can be broken down into categories like open pollinated, so we're looking at heirloom types, greenhouse varieties, which in the case of everything that we're talking about here, we're talking about hoop house production for market. You want to get the right seed for the right growing conditions, which more than likely means some type of hybrid, non-GMO. I want you to make a relationship with your seed rep. We're not a seed company. I know a lot about this stuff, but I want you to talk to your seed reps that are working in your territory, that know your market, that know your conditions, and that are keeping up to date on the very latest information and varieties, and that can help you choose. Now the reason we did that whole calendar exercise and the reason we wanted you to identify your market, your growing conditions and all that is so you can call your rep early before they get busy because I don't know if you know this, but a lot of us are procrastinators and some of you are gonna order your seeds past way past time that you're supposed to. So making that early call to your seed reps, developing that relationships, they're going to have more time to invest in you while they're less busy. They'll talk to you about fruit size, the firmness when ripe, disease resistance, especially in your region or your area. They're gonna know this stuff. And features like taste, color, as well as best use like slicing salads or paste tomatoes. One thing I want you to keep in mind is a lot of these, it says days to maturity. And what I need you to understand is days to maturity is maturity is when you're first pulling off your first tomatoes. That is not when you first plant your seed. That is when you plant the transplant. This is not true for leafy vegetables. So if you see lettuce, a lot of these are 45, 55 days. You plant the seed 45, 55 days later, pulling a head of lettuce out of the ground. Fruiting crops are different. Fruiting crops being tomato, 
So whenever it says, hey, maybe it's 65, 75 days to maturity, that's when you plant that in the ground. So please keep that in mind as you're selecting your seeds and backdating your calendar for when you're going to start your seeds in that pot. Again, high level seed starting, your seed mix is either gonna consist of some type of cocoa core or peat, depending on your tolerance for that, some perlite and trace minerals. So basically you want a very well-draining loose soil that your tomatoes can start and thrive in and put out those roots, knowing that you're going to likely up pot that at least once, hopefully and probably twice into much larger containers. And instead of planting a very tiny tomato at the last frost date, you're planting a much larger, more established root system to help prevent that transplant shock. And I just gotta say, there's a lot of different stuff out on the market. I, uh, most people that I talk to tend to go with Pro Mix. It's a great seed starting. There's different types. So please take a look at whatever company you're looking at. Take a look at their information. Not all seed starting and soil mixes are created equally. Some specialize in vegetables, some specialize in cactus. There's a big difference between the two. Just make sure that your foundation for your seed starts, which is probably the most important stage of your life, has a good outcome quantity to start. That's why we did that whole exercise of taking a look at your hoop house, figuring out the number of rows, figuring out the number of plants per row, figuring out your spacing. If you need 400 plants, you know, I would start 440 tomatoes. You're going to want to look at 10 to 20 percent for germination issues. Sometimes you have to replace a plant after you transplanted it. And any of these extra plants, just like I'm going to have you think about, hey, not all fruit is great and sellable. That's perfect. How do we save that and not have any food waste? I don't want you to have any transplant waste. So plan on the extra to be up potted for sale either at a market, maybe give to a community gardens and growing conditions to help you optimize every single seed that you're investing into. Check the seed package for the recommendations and use a thermostat with a soil probe to control your heat mat. Tomatoes are a heat loving plant. They often need higher temperatures than what leafy greens are going to need. You see that little icon right there that says YouTube video. We have a whole video on the germination and how to use a heat mat and when and when is not appropriate tomatoes appropriate aim for 60 to 80 percent humidity of course you can use a humidity dome for larger operation that may need a germination chamber you could also consider uh, they're pretty inexpensive they're uh, meant for home use but you can stick one in a germination chamber and it's a, a warm water humidifier that puts that humidity into the air take a look and this also means that, hey, you need to get a humidity and temperature gauge for that ambient temperature wherever you're starting your seeds from. So blackouts, lights, and hardening off. Blackout, about one week or until those seeds hit 80% germination in the cell trays. You're likely to use grow lights because almost every single tomato farmer starts these plants inside so they can grow up over the course of the winter. So you have those bigger plants. Keep repeating myself, it's worth mentioning. And you need to take a look at, there's, there's lumens, there's spectrums. You need to take a look at those recommendations from whatever supplier you're getting that from. And they'll give you a recommended height. Once the plants are ready for the first round of up potting, possibly the second round, you can take a look at your internal temperature of your hoop house and as long as it's in the 65, 70 degree range, or you're using some frost blankets, you can start hardening that off in the hoop house. When it comes to starting your siege, you're gonna start that in one of three different scenarios. One, one of our air prune trays. Two, one of our cell trays. Three, you can use the soil blockers because we're starting seeds in mass. Tomatoes are a little bit different in that you're likely to start this in either a 50 or a 72 cell. Unless you really got something going on and you're a seasoned grown already, I almost never ever see somebody start 200 cells of tomatoes, A, because they grow so quickly, they need a lot of room to grow, so you're starting those in bigger blocks. Your first round of up potting is going to promote stronger root systems and enhance the overall plant health. Again, you see that, you see that icon in which we have another very detailed video about that specific process. And we also have a whole series on soil blocking, so if you're into that, check that out. You got time to figure that out before the next season. So high level up potting also improves your nutrient uptake. And the main reason for up potting is it gives you a lot of insurance against transplant shock. So you can plant taller vines with flowering and fruit clusters to be the first to market and extend the growing season. When we're extending the growing season, we're extending that pounds per vine per season. So starting a month earlier, pulling fruit a month earlier, maybe we can go from 15 pounds per plant to 20 pounds per plant with just that one operation of up potting. You're doing your up potting process, and you're thinking about transplanting that out, here's what needs to happen before that happens. Number one, yearly, 
a soil test. So first thing, tomatoes thrive in slightly acidic or neutral soils with a pH range of 6 to 6.8. That soil test is going to help determine if adjustments are needed, such as adding lime to raise the pH or sulfur to lower it. All of that means that the plant is in an optimal condition to uptake the rest of the nutrients that we're fixing to talk about. Nutrient contact, NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. All of these critical for tomato development. Nitrogen gives you that leaf growth, the phosphorus helps the roots grow, and the potassium enhances disease resistant and overall plant health. Knowing the levels of these nutrients allow precise fertilization and avoid deficiencies or toxicities. Soil test, I need you to understand that your soil in this tunnel could be vastly different in the soil in this tunnel if you're doing a crop rotation. What a plant the year before uptakes or leaves behind or adds to is going to change year over year. That's why you need to do these soil tests. Do them as soon as possible, get the results back. When they say, hey, you need calcium at this percentage, you need to understand how your equipment is calibrated and puts those rates out. I cannot, it's impossible for me to say, hey, a foliar spray, you need to add six ounces of this because I don't know those levels. I don't know the sprayer. I don't know the dilution rate of whatever nutrient that you decided to pick up. The whole purpose of this video, again, super high level, it gives you things to think about. And if you go, hey, I'm gonna get a soil test and here's my backpack sprayer, here's my pump sprayer, Here's, you know, it says to dilute, you know, one ounce per gallon, but one ounce per gallon out of this spray tip, it's a different calibration. You really need to look into that. There's no way possible for me to get into that. So as you're leaving this video, take a look at how to calibrate your spray equipment or your granular equipment. Organic matter. The soil test is also going to tell you uh, how much organic matter is present. What you don't want is a stale seed bed. This also is going to help with water retention capability and nutrient availability. High levels of organic matter improve soil fertility, aeration, and promotes robust root systems and healthier plants. One little thing I want to kind of caution, especially the urban or peri-urban farmers against is, I know that there's free mulch and compost available at a lot of city infrastructure places. I personally would not bet the farm, literally bet the farm on a city worker's ability or inability to create great compost. Are they turning it enough? Are they getting it hot enough? And my main concern is they are getting branches, leaves, whatever from all over the city. People like, hey, I took up a garden and now you're gonna chop it up and you're gonna put it in there. We don't know what pest, we don't know what diseases, we don't know, again, the temperature that they're doing this with. There may be a bunch of seeds in there. There may be a bunch of poison ivy in there. I would not, and I cannot warn you enough, don't use the free compost available from municipalities or sometimes counties. Go ahead and invest in your compost. It's the thing that everything is going to grow in. Speaking of the free compost, one other thing, and the, another thing the soil test is gonna tell you is if there is any contamination. So again, more likely to be an urban, peri-urban, as some of us are converting uh, traditional farmland into market gardens and kind of retaking that soil back for what we all want it to be. Some of these pieces of land do have some toxins in there. Some of that compost that you're going to get for free is going to cost you in them because they have toxins. A soil test is going to tell you what you're up against and it may very well tell you, hey, do not plant here. It's not worth it. We talked about that relationship with the seed reps. Make that relationship with your county extension office. These are people that want to see you succeed in your farm venture. So they have resources to help they are likely to either help you with a soil test or point you in the right direction. A lot of times it's going to an independent lab within the state or an independent lab within a state university or a state college. So if you don't know where, a little search, point you in the right direction. There's solarization, there's oculation. We have a whole video about it. You can check that out in detail, but just know that I want you to kill or suppress the weeds early on in the season so when you transplant, you're, you're tending to the plants and you're not picking weeds and you're not stepping over weeds and they're not competing for the nutrients that we just talked about. Also, you can take a look at landscape fabric or mulch in between the rows to further suppress the weed season. You don't want bare ground showing up. Bare ground inevitably is going to have weeds. I don't care what you do. So being able to suppress that in one way reduces your overall labor, lets you, let you allocate that time for tending to your plant and taking that from 15 pounds to 20 pounds because you're focusing on the plant 
not the weeds. From that soil analysis, it's going to tell you the amount of amendments you put in at the correct rates, work that into the soil with the uh, soil prep method of your choosing, whether that's a BCS or a broad fork. Transplanting. A couple of days before that, please give your irrigation that final test run. This will help detect any of the repairs that need to be made. It'll also help pre-soak your tomato rows and moisten the new bed. Don't plant these into dry soil and also don't water and then try to plant, transplant. It's a muddy mess. That's why I want you to do it a couple of days before. It's moist, but it's not gross. When you plant your tomatoes, plant them a little bit below grade. They like to be planted deep, so two to four inches below grade. And bring the soil to the stem. Again, 18 to 24 inches apart. This is one time I'm not overly conservative unless it's your first year, maybe do the 24. But if we're talking about pounds per plant, per season, and maximizing every single available square inch without overplanting, 18 inches is great. And listen, the overplanting, we're gonna to get to that in a second, but the reason I keep harping on the overplanting and, and making sure our spacing is correct because you can get the tomatoes too dense. Too dense means less airflow. Less airflow means we're opening ourselves up to pests, diseases, and not being able to see, maintain, and fully get the full benefits out of the plant. They're shading each other out. The spacing is very important. I tend to be a little less conservative, but if it's your first year, do that 24 inch spacing and work yourself into a comfortable level as you go. If you're planting, multiple varieties, which you should do to tailor that to your market, please group those for easier harvesting. Listen, what you don't want to do is go, hey, I want this thing to be fun, so I'm going to plant a grape and then a cherry and then a slicer, and then when you go to harvest, you're like, now you got to carry three buckets around, right? One row, one variety, one box. Once you're done transplanting, watering good without oversaturating. Basically, when it comes to oversaturating, I don't want you to see a pool of water. Not only is that too much water for the plant, now you're inviting things like mosquitoes and any other kind of waterborne disease or pest. Hey, here's a nice place to grow and thrive and hurt my plants. So now we have a whole how to water section. We already talked a little bit about the watering when you start your seeds and that from cell tray, when you first start to germinate to the up potting, you're likely to be uh, bottom watering to keep the water off the foliage. A little bit different whenever you get into the hoop house itself. Do I need overhead? Do I need drip irrigation? The answer is you need both. When you first transplant your seeds, even if they've been up potted, the root ball is contained within a little bit. And if you don't up plant, it's really contained into a smaller part. And so if you have drip irrigation lines, think about a two foot bed and you have a drip irrigation line here, here, and here, the drip is going to go straight down, may or may not oversaturate. So the overhead watering, when you have the small plant, is going to cover the entire surface and those smaller root balls are guaranteed to get some water no matter what. This only has to be for a week or two, but it's the most critical week of the tomato plant's life as they're growing and surviving. So give them that two weeks, 10 days worth of overhead, completely saturate everything. You're not gonna have to worry about your walkways because remember you put a landscape fabric or mulch down give those plants enough water, and then slowly transition over a couple of three days to the drip irrigation. And you'll be able to tell right away because you're gonna do the responsible thing and monitor your plants a couple of times throughout the day to see if they're wilting or limping and adjust your water as necessary. I've said it before, I'm gonna say it again, and I'll probably say it a hundred more times in my career, that I'm gonna give you the very best piece of information I ever got on tomato growing, and that's when to water. Number one, Please don't water at night. The whole purpose of a tomato plant is not to grow a tomato, it's the plant just wants to live. And the plant lives, again, this is a heat loving plant. They're used to being hot. So in response to that, the tomatoes are there to act as a reservoir for the plant of water. And so if you're watering at night, the plant is going to instinctively take on more water and take on more water. And if it has too much water than what it needs, as the fruit grows, it's going to outgrow the skin. It's going to split. You're going to have an imperfect tomato, which means you take a $4 tomato. It's not even worth $3 now. Now it's worth maybe a dollar. Maybe you give it away. Maybe you have to turn it into salsa. Don't overwater the tomatoes. So here's the best piece of advice I ever got. Water two hours after the sun rises. Let the soil warm up a little bit. Water two hours before the sun sets. And in the very dead of the summer, when temperatures are, let's say, above 95 and into the hundreds, which is okay, you're also going to give it a third round of watering dead center in the middle of the day. So they have this nice drink of water throughout the day without so much that you're going to have splits in the skin. So when you're harvesting little grape and cherry tomatoes, 
you already have to be gentle and delicate, which is why I don't want you to plant like an overly crazy amount. But if you start seeing splits, it's time to start dialing down that water two hours after sunset, two hours before sundown, right in the middle in the summer. Again, the airflow is so important. The very top of the vine, the crown, is where the fruit starts to develop and you're leaning and lowering on the trellis. Leaves are starting to develop. Fruit is starting to get bigger and bigger. As that process happens and now you come to that harvest zone a few feet off the ground, you're going to start defoliating the leaves. That lets you clearly see and clearly harvest the tomatoes. Once that's done, you're going to clip those stems off and you're going to wind up with these very long vines that are just one straight vine that go into the harvest area, that then go into the leaf canopy, that then go into the crown. And so if you're not harvesting all of that space in between, you're affecting the airflow, you're getting more diseases, you're getting more pest. Lower and leaning, the top right picture is my Dutch bucket tomato greenhouse. The pruning and the trellising lower and leaning process is no different from hydro Dutch bucket tomatoes than it is soil. But you can see in these four pictures that having clean vines yields to better fruit. We have a very extensive four-part series in one of our tomato playlists in which we identify and prune indeterminate tomatoes in a hoop house. We lean and lower, we trellis, and then we go into a tunnel that's completely overgrown and it overhaul a row so you can see just how much of this stuff is clipped up. It's one of our most popular set of videos, so that's going to give you all the information you need on lower and leaning. We can now move on. When it comes to pruning the tomatoes, your tools make all the difference in the world. This is not something you're going to go to the dollar store and get some garden pruners. They're often too big, they're not the right kind. You want a professional model, your choice, there's a tons out there. My personal preference after pruning, I don't know how many tomato plants for so long, I like a little bit smaller, I like a rounded but kind of needle nose point so I can really get in there. You're going to hold this thing for hours at a time over and over again. So. Make sure that you get something that you're comfortable with and can go in and out of these vines and clip the leaves or the clusters, whatever you need to do. One thing I don't hear anybody talking about is at the end of the day, you want to dip them in some alcohol, cover them in some alcohol that's going to help reduce the disease pressure that you get from opening the wounds up on these cuts. You also want to daily sharpen, maybe weekly sharpen. I like, I like my tomato snips super sharp. I don't want to work harder than I have to. And then oil up the exposed surfaces so you don't have this rusty tool that you're going to use every day. My own personal preference, I like to do all this tomato maintenance with an apron on. A, I like, some aprons have like a bunch of little pouches, don't do that. Get two big pouches, maybe a couple of like auxiliary pouches because you want your tomato clips, twine, and it, however process you're going through the leaning and lowering, you want to have something that you can easily access, load up, do a couple of rows at a time, keep your snips, keep your cell phone, whatever but also the apron protects your clothes. Maintaining tomato vines, you're going to get these green hands that I don't like working in gloves, maybe you do, whatever, but you're gonna have very dirty hands that's gonna translate into ruining your clothes. I like an apron. Integrated pest management. This is again, something I could spend days on, but I'm gonna give you a great resource here in a second. Just remember to daily monitor. Make this part of your farm's workflow to daily visual monitor, this must happen. You have this many plants, this dense, one little problem can exponentially get worse over time very fast. There's larvae, there's eggs, there's disease that can come out of nowhere and completely take over a hoop house real quick. So not only do you have to continue to monitor, but you should have pre and continued pest and disease training before the season, during the training. Your labor force needs a reminder these are things to look out for. It's part of your farm owner responsibility to make sure your people are aware of these situations, they're looking out for it. Different pests come on at different times, different diseases happen throughout the year. Remind them to look out for this and let you know as soon as possible. Everything that we talked about is a year-long investment starting at the very beginning of the season and you're growing, 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 growing. And if you slip, you could lose a whole tomato hoop house real quick. And if you take a look at those numbers and financials that we first took a look at, that's a whole lot of money ruined for, let's just call it what it is, being a little lazy. Let's not do that. Listen, to this day, I know a lot of farmers, occasionally, several times a year, I'll get a text, hey, what's wrong with my tomato? I don't know, I'm not there. Even a picture is a little hard to determine. The very best resource that I've ever found straight up is from the University of Tennessee, their Institute for Agriculture. 
they put out in 2014 a commercial vegetable and disease guide. Pause, take a look at this link, write it down. You can also go in the description below. I have this link. This is going to give you several pages of PDFs that have very detailed pictures about every single disease and every single pest on the tomato that's possible and what to do about it. It's a great guide and I, we don't have to spend any more time on it. Check that out. If you further want a resource, I highly suggest that in your web browser when you're typing stuff up, tomato diseases, that you start with your state universities or state, state schools. Go to their search box, type tomato. Some of these programs, Cornell, Purdue, Arizona State, they have extensive, extensive resources and obviously Tennessee, but they have all these resources that are backed by scientific research, by people that, you know, tomato people are way into tomatoes and they dedicate their lives to making tomatoes better for you. Let them help you. Take a look at that research. If you want a second opinion, it's all over the place, but I highly suggest .edu websites. So this slide, this is from my farm in Paris, Texas. Uh, I had an indoor hydro leafy green. I had a seasonal high tunnel. You can see where this kitty cat is. I had the hydro tomato and cucumber tunnel. And I want to tell you, the worst thing I ever did was I got lazy a couple of years in, and I assumed that any pest pressure was just going to kind of take care of itself. I got lazy, and that's why I said what I said earlier about don't do that. Don't do what I did. The pest pressure got so bad I had to ruin an entire crop. Use my loss to your benefit. Don't hope for the best. Have your controls on hand and stored properly and have your equipment ready and working. And again, understand how to calibrate your equipment. Let me tell you what happened. I had a pest infestation. I hoped it would go away. It did go away. A couple of weeks into it, I got overrun with white flies. I then called my seed rep. What do I do? We had to order the controls to take care of that. And at that time, it got too bad. I had to use a pesticide. It was an organic derived pesticide, but I didn't want to spray, but I had to get over that. And then I had to wait for that to show up. And then, oh, by the way, you need to use this piece of equipment to put this out. And then I had to order that. And then that got lost in the mail. Murphy's Law, I keep saying it, if something's gonna go wrong, it's gonna go real wrong. And so because I didn't have this on hand, because I didn't know what to do beforehand, because I had to rely on somebody else and I had to rely on UPS and thankfully they were in stock, but all these things were working against me. By the time I finally got the controls in, I had to wipe out the entire crop and start over mid season. Don't do that. We just talked about the investment that you're doing in tomatoes. Have this stuff ready to go. Train your people. It's your responsibility as the farm owner. A little bit ago, we talked about bifurcation. Again, the single leader. I feel like we've covered that enough. You understand one plant, one leader, easy. The bifurcation, one plant, two liters. Just one thing to consider is this method can reduce the number of transplants needed. But if you lose one plant, you lose two liters. From a conservative standpoint, financially, growing half the number of tomato plants, especially with some of these seeds, could be upwards of a dollar. Yes, you could save half of your seed cost by doing a two liter situation. A lot of farmers do it. This is a personal choice. My view on it, if I lose one plant, I only want to lose one liter. If I lose one plant, I have those backups from up potting and kind of taking care of those up pots for the first month before I have an excess and then sell it to market. About the same yield with less plants. It does take a little bit longer to come on, so you do lose, lose a couple of weeks early in on the season. But then you do need 24 inches of spacing. One plant, 24 inches, that's the minimum. So look into that a little bit more. I'm not a huge fan of it, but that's a personal preference of mine. Maybe one year you experiment with in a row, see what you like better. Now, some of you may be interested in grafting tomatoes. You can combine two different plants, one with the best soil borne disease resistance with the best characteristics of fruit. It was explained to me that you can steer the plant vigor and that some of these grafts will put on a lot of growth real quick. And this is especially important for northern growers who have a much shorter season. You just really want to cram as much input into that as possible versus, and that's a sprint, versus a marathon type of growing in which a southern state may want characteristics that let that plant grow out over the entire season and have a very even distribution of fruit throughout that growing season. This is extra cost, this is extra labor. If you buy it, it's gonna be even more costly. So where I'm coming from 
is I never grafted. I'm not ever going to sit here on any of these videos and yarn on about stuff I don't know about. I've given you some details to look at. If you want to look at grafting, there's a ton of resources out there. Andrew Medford, who's a past guest, is really into it and Growing for Market Magazine has a lot of great articles on it and I know that at the end of the year they plan to put some stuff out. This is 2024, but I'm not a grafting expert. I know that the question's gonna come up. It's something you need to investigate on your own to see if it's right for your operation. You can expect to harvest two to three times a week depending on your sales outlet and size of the operation. And what I mean by that is if you have a 30 by 100, there's no way you can pick all the tomatoes that you're going to take to that market and cover every single plant in one or two days. You're gonna to have to have that extra day. So how does that work? When the tomato starts to blush, so when it goes to green and it starts getting that little pink, you can pull that off of the vine, and if stored properly, you can let that ripen in storage before you go to the market or before you deliver to the restaurant or whatever your sales outlet is. Try not to let that tomato go more than one week from the time you pull it to the time it gets in the customer's hands. You'll simply twist or snip, depending on your preference. I like to snip. I know a lot of people like to twist, but I found that I had less fruit damage when I did the snip. And plus, a lot of markets like that little vine on the tomato kind of look. So your choice. And it also has to depend on the variety. In the picture down to the left is Brian Mossenbacher, who I'm very excited is going to come to the Bootstrap Farmer Studios this November to do a whole bunch of content with us on permaculture design. So please subscribe below so you don't miss any of that. But this is Brian Mossenbacher taking a look at the large tomatoes should be stored upside down on the shoulders of their tomatoes. So that little rib that forms on some varieties, that's a very thick part of the tomato. Turn those guys over, a little bit of extra protection, single layer. They are able to store properly without a whole lot of damage. Please move all fruit out of the tunnel before they get too ripe. I know a marketing tactic grocery stores do, not farmers, but grocery stores, hey, these are vine ripened tomatoes. When people go to the tomatoes, they're ready to eat these guys right now. When you're a farmer, you have to consider the transport to the market and from the market to somebody's house, refrigerator, whatever. I know everybody listening to this has picked up a tomato when they're fixing to buy it. They give it a little squeeze. They try to determine the ripeness of the tomato. Nobody wants an overripe tomato. It's not going to sell. Pull these out before it happens. The other thing is don't put these in the refrigerator. Store them at 55 to 65 degrees inside. Keep them out of the sunlight. That's going to nice and evenly ripen. The other thing is during this process, you're going to be grading the fruits. So Premier in seconds, your Premier is like the perfect tomato, just a little bit underripe, ready to go to the market. That is something that you should be getting the highest value from your highest profit type of client. The seconds, maybe they're imperfect, maybe they're misshaped, maybe they got a little defect. Those can go into a separate bin. You can still sell those and sell them at a lower rate. Pounds of tomatoes or pounds of tomatoes. Depending on the price point that you sell those at, you're gonna make more profit on others, you're gonna make less profit on some. Sure, sometimes you're gonna give some away, sometimes you're gonna take a blemish like a split and you're gonna turn it into a sauce or a salsa or something like that and still cut the bad part out, but use the rest of that to have an even higher profit, I've added profit, especially once you start combining it with other things on your farm, like different herbs or different vegetables. And a lot of that's gonna fall into cottage laws, and we're not gonna go down that rabbit hole too much, but it's something to consider. A vine of tomatoes, each tomato can have a different price point if you have the proper sales channels in place. Also, don't store bad tomatoes with good tomatoes. Set those aside, don't let that affect the other one, and I'll get to that in a second. So on that harvest and storage and grading, I want you to now take a look at those sales channels. There's no reason to plant any tomato seeds unless you've thought about your market and where your tomatoes are gonna be sold at. I like to view this in four different quadrants. A premium product, service, or event. A bread and butter product, I'm talking about the thing that you're known for, the thing that you specialize in, what you do week over week. For most of us, it's going to chef sales, it's going to a CSA, or it's going to be sold at the farmer's market, or some combination of that. The thing that you do day in and day out bread and butter. I also want you to think about a wholesale option. And a wholesale is any time you take a tomato, sell it to somebody else, they in turn sell it, resell it, turn it into something and sell it to somebody. This is a chef situation that kind of blurs, blurs the lines between chef sales and wholesale, but a lot of times the chef is your bread and butter, so you know, it could go either way. 
It also has to do a little bit with volume. Do you want to sell to 10 individual chefs or do you want to sell to a distributor, make one trip, have one pickup, have standard boxes? These are all things to consider for market gardeners and for the people that this video is out of, even 10,000 pounds, it could go one of several different ways, but just think about it. The last and final quadrant is what I like to consider a passion project. I know a lot of farmers want to do some type of give back. Maybe that's donating to a food bank. Maybe they take their surplus to a food bank. But any process in which you take your fruits and you give it or sell at a highly, highly reduced rate, that's not is what's going to pay the bills. I know that's an outlet and we need to discuss it and think about it prior to time or grow to satisfy that need that you may have, but it's not what pays all the other bills. Now, when we talk about the premium and the seconds and the added value stuff and the special events, you know, two to three special events that you participate or throw on your own a year can really pay a lot of bills all at once, but it has to be something special and not something that you do every week. The bread and butter, going to the farmer's markets, hey, every week I got my 50 people that come see me and they buy a pint of tomato each, that's your bread and butter. So we need to take a look at what's high profit, what's low profit, what's high cost, what's low cost. And that cost could be what's high cost to you, what's high cost to your client, what's low cost to you, what's low cost to your client. All of these play in together. But I really, really encourage each of you to have those four quadrants in mind as you're setting up your sales channels. You may discover that you only have one sales outlet. Maybe it's a CSA, but maybe within that CSA, you can take all your seconds a couple of times a week, make a big batch of salsa, and that's part of your CSA. But what that does is that takes your lower value fruit and turns it into something with a higher value that you add to that box. And you don't have to do that every week. It's that special reminder that you give your clients that, hey, man, I wasn't expecting this, and now I got this awesome thing, a salsa that's homemade from my farmer that I know. That's a big added value proposition right there. Going back to the storage. Now, we talked a little bit about not storing blemished fruit with non-blemished fruit. I also want you to further think about storing with other crops, and I don't want you to store tomatoes with carrots or leafy greens or anything like that. That needs to be in a separate area because of ethylene. Ethylene in tomatoes is a natural plant hormone that plays a critical role in the ripening process. It's a gas that the tomato fruit puts out and it triggers a series of changes within the fruit. That includes ripening, color changes, softening or over ripening, and the flavor and aroma. Now what happens when ethylene is being off-gassed by a tomato is if we have blushing tomatoes over here with ripe tomatoes over here, and if they're too close together, these ripe tomatoes are going to basically affect the ripening process of these blushing. And so while you may pull these off at the very, very end of the week and maybe push those into the next week or close about, you can overripen those much faster. If you're storing newly blushed tomatoes, with almost overripe tomatoes, that's gonna ripen those at a much faster rate, which means all of that work and effort that you put in may be lost before it even has time to go to the market. The other thing that it can do with leafy greens in particular is affect the flavor profile of the greens and maybe even turn those a little bitter. So you don't wanna store leafy greens and tomatoes anywhere near each other. This also affects like avocados and bananas and some more tropical fruit that you're less likely to have to deal with, but if you're on a farm that has apples or most of you are going to have carrots, it could soften the carrots and the apples if they're stored next to a tomato because ethylene interplays with all that ripening across the board. So please be careful and be aware of ethylene as you're planning out your infrastructure on your farm, your storage, your refrigeration, all that stuff needs to come and be thought about. Now, I know a lot of people worry about heat. I'm not going to beat a dead horse. We've had extensive videos on heat now we're gonna look at this on two different very high level, which is non-powered heat reduction layers. We're talking about shade cloth, we're talking about roll-up sides, we're going to let the fresh air in, we're going to block the UV. Again, uh, endless videos that we've put out on this particular item. Also, active ventilation, this is thermostat controlled powered vans and shutters. So anything active, electrical, the fan's gonna open up, it's gonna push hot air out, it's gonna bring fresh air in, the tomatoes love heat. Again, you can expect a little bit of yield decline in the very top of the summer. And so, you know, maybe, maybe they're putting out more fruit in the late spring and early fall because they're not as stressed, but that doesn't mean it's time to panic. Just give them as many layers as you can possibly afford or do, and I promise you're gonna be okay. Don't forget that irrigation either. 
If we're going to talk about heat, we need to talk about season extension. Again, potting up early seed starts, getting ahead of the curve when it comes to bigger plants, and doing the hardening off process is a big part of that. The other thing that you need to have on hand, ready to go, is I know we spend a lot of time on that first frost date, last frost date situation. Have those frost blankets ready in the early part of the season as you transplant. Weather's crazy these days, we all know it. If you happen to have a cold snap or you wanna give your tomatoes a little bit of extra care at night, go ahead and put those frost blankets on. Just be ready to have them. Again, extensive videos, you see the icon. So, what did we learn? We learned that tomato production at scale like this to push those pounds per plant per year over the course of the season starts well before the time you transplant, well before the time you seed. It starts at the planting stages. We've given you some ideas on, look, maybe you have some great yields one year and some bad yields the next. Here's the other thing. If you have a hoop house, you can expect that the outside of the hoop house, I'm talking about the side walls, the end walls, those plants are likely to yield less than the plants in the middle because those plants even act as an insulating layer. This pocket of air on the inside that's more perfect and more even because of some of the air circulation and the exhaust, if we have nice air pockets, that's protecting all the plants. The plants on the outside, they get a little bit more beat up. So you can expect these plants may be 15 pounds, these plants may be 20 pounds. We're looking at the overall average for the hoop house. Knowing that the pounds per plant can be variable from 10 to 30 pounds. 10 being if a lot of stuff goes wrong, 30 is if every single little thing, including the weather and stuff you can't control is perfect. You have a wide range. You at least have a starting point of, hey, I need to make $20,000 this year, this year. This is how many plants I need to do. This is how much space I have. Is it even possible? Or do I need to mix in other crops or do other activities to bring in other income on the farm? This is a very high level, Lots of variables, just things to think about. We also have to look at that growing curve and all of the variables that we talked about in the, in the last third of this video and look how each one of those things can individually affect a plant throughout the season or for a very short window of the season or how doing one little thing at the beginning or end can really make a difference on the overall pounds per plant per year during the season. If we take a look at our sales channels and optimize every single little tomato, or every single hopefully big tomato that comes off that vine, do you have a way to sell it at some type of income driven situation? Whether you're selling that tomato for $10 a tomato or basically giving it away to a food bank, but you feel good about what you're doing at the end of the day or anything in between to generate income, I want you to think about all that. Please subscribe. Please leave a comment on the number one takeaway that you had from this video. And we'll see you in the next one.